The American Revolutionary War had just kicked off, and the armed forces of Great Britain were one of the largest, most professional and most effective on the planet. But on a grassy hillside on the outskirts of Boston, Massachusetts, they were about to be given a pretty big kick up the backside that would alter the very strategies of King George III's troops for the remainder of the conflict. 1775, and tensions are rapidly rising between the North American colonialists and the British. This has come about largely because the British are running out of money. For the past decade or so, King George III's troops have been pursuing their long-held hobby of squabbling with the French. This time, over which bits of the North American continent each country could have. Their inability to come to an amicable agreement resulted in what became known as the Seven Years' War. Britain eventually won this conflict, but at huge expense, and piled huge amounts of debt onto the British government. But not to worry, as they had a plan. As a good deal of these expensive military campaigns were taking place in North America, simply tax the colonies. Seems fair. 1764 would see a sugar tax and import embargoes, ensuring that only taxable British sugar could be imported. 1765 would see the Stamp Act, resulting in all official papers such as licenses, legal documents, diplomas, and in fact virtually any printed document to be on officially stamped and embossed paper. And yes, you've guessed it, there'll be a tax for that. Further taxes would follow in 1767 with the Townsend Acts, placing taxes on British imports including paint, paper, lead, glass and tea. Suffice to say, the colonialists were not best pleased, and therefore they boycotted British businesses and imports forcing the British government to back down and repeal the taxes, which they did, except for one, tea. On the night of December 16, 1773 in Boston Harbour, a group of protesters disguised as Native Americans boarded a British trade ship and threw overboard the crates of tea that it was carrying. This event became known as the Boston Tea Party. By now there was a growing anti-British sentiment and it was spreading quickly across the colonies and a conference was held in Philadelphia in 1774, where an official request was made to the British government to withdraw their forces. Following the British refusal to go along with this, the colonialists formed militia units to be ready at a minute's notice. These men became known as the Minute Men. Fast forward to 1775, and in Lexington, Massachusetts, on the 18th of April, the militias and the British faced off. Following some verbal altercations, somebody was a little clumsy with their trigger finger, and a shot rang out. This shot heard around the world was the beginning of the American Revolutionary War. Following the beginning of the war, the many colonial militia units were organised into the Continental Army, with the commander-in-chief being George Washington. As a result of the skirmish in Lexington, the Continental Army had besieged Boston, where the British forces were based. But the British didn't really see this as too big a problem, as the British Navy was the biggest and strongest in the world and could easily send reinforcements and supplies whenever they pleased. The British forces in Boston were under the command of General Thomas Gage, and he was quite happily just sitting it out, waiting patiently for reinforcements to arrive to help break the siege. To help make the siege buster's job even easier, he looked to the hills just outside of Boston and thought it would be a pretty good idea to draw up some plans to occupy them and prevent them from being taken by the Continentals, as it would allow them to place artillery and potentially scupper the plans of the British siege busters. Unfortunately for General Gage, Continental spies had uncovered these plans, and so they planned to take the hills first, which they did. They set up a fortified position on the highest peak at Bunker Hill, and laid defensive positions on Breed's Hill, which lay further down towards the harbour. The Continentals were under the command of Colonel William Prescott, and his plan was to use Breed's Hill to fend off any British attack. On the morning of the 17th of June, 1775, the attack came. HMS Lively, which was sitting at the entrance of the Charles River, opens fire on the colonialist fortifications. This bombardment is soon joined by British coastal guns, and unfortunately for the British, the bombardment falls short of the target and causes little damage. However, it does cause damage to the morale of some of the defenders, as many flee the battle scene. Seeing the limited scope of artillery bombardment, the British called upon plans for a land-based assault on the fortified positions, and by midday, it had begun. The initial plan was to advance on Breed's Hill for a frontal attack, along with a second advance around the right-hand side, with the intention of flanking and confusing the poorly trained colonial forces. 
The Continentals, due to their effective leadership, had however organised strong defensive positions and utilised the long grass by concealing several obstacles and this helped them to repel the British first advance. The British forces retreated and then began a bombardment on nearby Charlestown which was a Continental stronghold. It was hoped that this would cause a considerable distraction as well as a smokescreen ahead of a second British advance. The advancing soldiers reformed and began their second assault. Unfortunately, the prevailing wind did not allow the smoke from the pummeled Charlestown to conceal their advance and the defenders were able to watch the British struggle to navigate their way through the waist-high grass which was concealing defensive obstructions as well as the dead and the dying from the first wave attack. This played into the hands of the defending Continentals as they were running low on ammunition but now they could afford to wait until the British were well within range. After 30 minutes or so, and the British now running out of men and ammunition, they retreated again. The second wave had fared no better than the first. After assessing the depleted manpower, the British managed to assemble enough men for a third advance on the hill. This time, however, they had more success, simply based on the fact that the Continentals had run out of ammunition and many soldiers had fled. The advancing soldiers had made the summit and were able to engage in close combat and as the British had bayonets fitted, something the colonialists did not, the battle was finally decided and the British had secured Bunker Hill. The British forces may have won this battle, however at great cost, both physically and psychologically. The Continental forces had 115 men killed with 305 wounded, but the victorious British had 226 men killed with 766 wounded and amongst the dead were 19 key officers. Despite the victory, it had shown to the British, one of the most professional and well-trained fighting forces in the world, that a hastily assembled militia, albeit under an effective leadership and fighting using guerrilla tactics, could indeed present a serious challenge and cause significant losses. This would have a lasting effect on British military planners in the battles and conflicts to come. If you enjoy these videos, please take a moment to subscribe and not forget to hit the bell icon so you receive notifications for every future episode. Thanks very much for watching.